Hello everyone. Today's talk is a very interesting one, and it's titled "Spinning the Wheels of Time." And I, I know that right now, the aspect of you listening will be an aspect that is comfortable to observe any form of change. And so this talk will have fluctuations in imagery because I will be explaining how my experience of time through my own sense of, let's say, self-contemplation has changed. And so I will be explaining as much as it's required within this moment, conceptions about time that lead to it never being there. So I have just came into being, guys, and I have spun the wheel of time. And so as the wheel of time has spun, so has space existed in a manner where I can observe it change. And I've decided out of this vast emptiness of reality to become this moving being, to become this walking being who can even talk and even record a talk. And so as I am walking in this reality, I have come into a moment where time and space has been allowed to be an unknown factor. Because once you see the vastness of your knowing, you no longer are bothered, are not bothered by what you don't know. You see that regardless of how you lived your life, the knowing is of a greater intelligence that acknowledges time and space in a simultaneous manner rather than in a, you know, A to B to C manner, you know? So, as the wheel of time has been spun, there was a moment where I would look at the clock and that's what time really meant, what I saw on the clock. Like there was no experiential aspect of time. But then when I sat down, and in a sense when life, in a sense, told me to sit down, it was as if it was, it was very interesting, as if in all my life experiences, suddenly this moment came into my reality and the moment was as if like everything was slowing down and stopping and I just sat down. And so it's as if there was this graceful, like, how do I say it? Like, sense of life comforting me, so I became still. And in my stillness, I opened my eyes to the nature that I saw. And the nature that I saw was not just plant life or the stream or just that very pleasant scene I was in, environment I was in, but it became everything that moving, that moved, showing me that it's all being received in the moment that I am. So it's one of those things where it's as if my intelligence jumped a quantum leap in recognizing it was never the type of intelligence I thought it was. And so that's when you really see the, how measurement can be such a small thing. You know, it's like people take measurement seriously, but measurement's like that moment where my pen accidentally drew another extra line on the page, the line on the page I was writing on. You know? It's, it's as if like that ink spot, it's, it's valuable because it's something I'm distin uh, distinguishing. You must see that you do not want to play games with yourself. And playing games with yourself appears when you have these toys, which you call realities, different ideas and imageries and fantasies, and you, you in a sense are putting life into it. So what that means is if I, I tell you what a happy life is, you will look for imagery first to then communicate to me. And that imagery could come from your memory, conditioning, or just how the environment is communicating to you at that moment. However, beyond imagery, there is a knowing. And so this is actually the beauty of how we have the intelligence of the endless sky, but also clouds that are just fading. And at times look back <coughs> at us like the faces that we have seen look at us before. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting how the abstract novel moment of man's existence is actually its gateway to everything. So, as the wheel of time has, was spun, in that moment, my awareness re-understood, if I can say that, my externality differently. So it's as if I noticed the jump, I noticed the difference, I noticed what the cloud was. And you can't, you don't know you're in a cloud, trust me. Don't think that you know you're in an illusion. You don't know right now you're in an illusion. And you don't know that you're not in an illusion. You don't know. You just, there's this profound I don't know, which is the veil. It's simply the limitation of the practice as man is considered. But where do you go after someone's called you limited? Where do you go when someone tells you you can't? You see there's an inspiration in man and in every great leader of man that's like, no, I want to walk and I will walk. You know, and so as, as, you, as you walk, you will see that 
it's actually you as a creator of experience can create a void for yourself when there's actually something there. And what that means is that I could go so deep into my fantasy in which I'm thinking about something that when you're talking to me, I don't hear you. And so that is why we, don't, we want to limit that sense of just being thrown in a void of not knowing where you are. When you don't know something, it's because you haven't looked clearly. And see, this is where clarity is valuable. Clarity is the medic of a mind that finds itself to be diseased. Clarity is the healing. It's not someone putting his hand there, it's just the clarity you get as a moment of experience in recognizing that. So sometimes the greatest healers or the greatest teachers were not ones who were trying to give you what you wanted. They were the ones who are about to break you to show you who you really are. And so they, that's why in actually traditionally you go look at India, it's not that the gurus were kind, like the most wonderful people. The guru was exactly the opposite of the spectrum of that being. So what that means is the person, uh, the guru, regardless of his realization of his formless presence, he still had a presence, but he would know that his teachings would be naturally there present. So what that means is that your mind automatically does not think so complexly, but you are doing complex things. So in a sense, you become that consciousness that in a sense is present, but intuition is never talked about. So you don't call it intuition, you don't call it uh, my intelligence, you don't call it wit, you don't have polarity, you don't have spectrum, because you are a unified moment of knowing. You are, for example, when I speak, it is not just me. It is the infinity that is within me that speaks. And so that infinity is beyond the limitation that a body can't move in new ways. You always can. Consciousness is its freedom. And so that freedom is a knowing beyond temporal reality because temporal reality becomes a shadow. But when you look at the sun, imagine that turn from looking at the shadow to the sun, it's, it's a different intensity of your intelligence. And so you're not trapped, you're not in a prison. You're just playing with toys, with toys for too long. In other words, don't just call it time and space. Go have direct experiences of it. Go sit down and observe the being that you are, the intelligence that you are, the life that you are. Don't take definitions from others at this point. Simply observe what that means to you. Have the ability to, in a sense, uh, just like, for example, that great golf player to see the whole audience fade and for him to simply see what, what, what he's here for. In other words, when I ask you, who are you, you shouldn't be like, oh, man, that's deep. No, it's not deep. It's just that we have not acknowledged it as a society, and so that is why the unknown seems so overwhelming. If you align with your natural sense of knowing, you will be walking not here. You are walking in your greatest conception. So it's not that you will live a bad life because you have the great ability to conceive one and walk in those uh, subtler planes as you exist. And so that is why it becomes a form of blissfulness, which I have recognized. And I don't know if this has been communicated because back then mystics didn't have YouTube. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that, that there is a type of bliss which your body feels, which many people you know, go into these highs which they try to induce with substance. But there's a high that is not a high in the sense that it's like you're sitting down and in a moment of existence, literally in, in one moment that you're aware, you are seeing a sense of your elevation into a sense of clarity, into an essence of clarity that could never be formed to even be eluded. It is that moment when you recognize that the mirror was not showing all of you, the mirror on your wall. Because this, there is no mirror at some point. You become the light that is bringing all that is. So in that sense, light becomes your teacher in realizing that light is an allowance. I would like to share a quote with you, and it's very relevant to what I was saying, because this quote goes on to say, and it's by Hafez, a very profound and realized Sufi mystic, and he says,
said, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look at what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. And such great wisdom is passed, guys, because it's saying when you get rid of these petty little ideas you have of wanting things, you acknowledge your being beyond a sense of a person who just, just got out of lack. You, it's as if like through your compassion, at some point your ideology leaves and you're just a natural emanation of peacefulness. You know? And so that's when you truly see the presence of the Dalai Lama being just a happy guy. <laughs> and it lights up the whole sky. Because once you give yourself that allowance, that existential allowance that it is okay for me to know the real me. It is okay for me to be my truth. You will in a sense see that you always had an ability to have your greater ability. It's just a moment of allowance. And I'm telling you guys, don't think it has to be too serious. Be playful and it comes. Get your things in life through playful and playfulness and there will be no guilt. But playfulness does not mean to be lazy and inefficient. That means to be playful, but you're the greatest mind. So every moment of your externality is doing great things. Whether you're brushing your teeth or you're, you know, speaking in front of an audience that is timeless. When we look at ourselves, the experience of time shifts into one that is no longer wanting. It's as if your consciousness realizes, oh God, time is not just like past, present, future. It's that the present was an experience of all potentials of in, in reality. It's as if you realize, oh, I could draw anything on the empty page. I'm not just what's been written. And so when you get that recognition, the awareness of the empty page is one that does not need limitations that need to be there in a sense. You, you don't have limitations or problems because you're not near them. You know what I mean? It's like you're not even thinking about them. Your attention is on such deeper aspects of reality that you're just, you're in a sense, uh, very comfortably being present. It's as if like you're no longer actually seeking for knowledge, but being aware of what you already know and what knowledge you have. And some aspects of your knowledge require your awareness. It's like you trans trans uh, transforming into a multidimensional awareness. So what that means is it's not just me talking here, it's me and all the probabilities of everything that I'm observing which I can in an instant individualize or unify. The choice is yours once you're aware that you, there's an aspect of you that's choiceless. And this aspect of you that's choiceless is the divine and it should not be layered in imagery. So all those people who throughout the years have been, let's say, worshipping a deity, the reason, they, they did not understand, but the reason the design of life came in to have so many people worship deities is because to keep imagery there in one sense so that after you've looked at that imagery, you dissolve. It's like not having so many words, just having one word to look at. It's as if you ask me what is the meaning of all reality and I just said compassion. And you would see that, wait, how could one word capture all reality? And you see it doesn't, but it's your vision to take that word and look at it in, in an infinite sky. The new horizons that really shows how man was beyond a number and the stability of man. Because the self-communication is an opening to how there is a greater sense of intelligence within you that was always there, but you never, in a sense, were there, you know? So it's how comfortable you are with the self, in which implies how comfortable you are with others. And this is important for many, many people because I didn't understand this relationship at first. I didn't understand how uh, I was always looking at other people to see how I should be in front of other people. So my mind went into this desperate modalities. Oh my God, what's this guy doing? Oh my God, what's this guy doing? And I noticed that when it went through that, that just bad mental circuitry, you know, just that bad movement through ideology, I noticed that 
The essence of every ideology is yourself. Every idea you have will come back to how you are experiencing the self. And so the experience of the self is that moment where you see my certainty is not something that's ever based on external reality. When you think you know something, that knowing is never based on external reality. It's only based on the observance of the external that is keeping external reality. So there's one aspect of your reality you acknowledge as a hologram and one aspect of your reality where there is no such thing as a hologram actually. But you see that it's as if the hologram was, was your step. It's as if like, you know, after you're on top of the staircase, you might be like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't, there's no longer any more stairs I gotta walk on. But there is, those stairs were significant at a certain aspect of your experience. So, you know, and it's very crazy because I love, I, I really love the concept of a treasure revealer and one that is just bringing new found sources of information, creativity, knowledge, and just uh, uh, communication to this point of dimension. So if I see a communicator, if I see someone, whether it's a singer, you know, just babbling about whatever, about chains and money, you know, or, or the, it's, it's a guru or some monk talking on YouTube, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just that I see it's how aware is that expression of life to life and it's very important because uh, I need to uh, suggest the importance of this it's very important that uh, children at an early age begin thinking not that they're about group activity it's like we stop too early with the group activities it's like you every child in the classroom must have an ability where they can experience or explore their leadership you know, and so the teacher must give actually not just the pressure of a few students to the kid, but actually must make the whole class, uh, uh, in a sense, listen to one kid and see how that kid is. And that kid explores his communication. The greatest thing that we can do is be teachers to one another by constantly saying that, oh, you don't know, buddy. Oh, you don't know, you don't know. And the sense of not knowing is our evolution. And it is actually uh, our evolution to a greater understanding and technological advance as well. Because even the wind has an information that you can use. And as I sat down, I understood that there never was a me because there was never a need for a story because the awareness of the empty page made you aware of the finger and the pen but also made you aware of the intelligence of the inspiration of the writer behind uh, the writer of all writers to be the unknown that is dictating the knowing and it's that moment where if you were only the experience of the tip of your finger the intelligence of the whole body is, the, is what is directing your position. And so the tip of the finger will see that it is present always within a greater reach. Much blessings and Namaste.